I was so moved at the beginning, and I shall, I hope, be moved again before the end of the evening by um, Deborah Perry and the Majestic Praise Group. And let me tell you why. I spoke with them before the event, and I just kind of got a little sampling of what was expected. And I, I went over, I said, I, I have to tell you something, you know. This little kid from Brooklyn, when I was, I, what was I, 16 maybe, when Edwin Hawkins came out with Oh Happy Day. And I, I was this little, at the time, scrawny, uh, Italian kid who would go to black Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches at, because I fell in love with the music and to hear them tonight do Oh Happy Day and then the blessing, it, it just thrilled me. And then I found out one of the members of the group is from Patterson, which is almost New York, not quite. <laughs> All you Midwesterners would think it's New York. You'd think we talk the same. But uh, it, it really moved me, and, and it, it made me feel so much um, more at home tonight. It's a sobering and a medicinal process to reflect on the past 31 years with an eye toward rendering some sort of account to you this evening of my stewardship of the Acton Institute and my hope for its future. Some of you have generously protested my choice to transition to emeritus status, given my relative health and vigor, not youth. <laughs> Thank you. Yet to my mind, I do not want to make the mistake that I have seen all too often by not ensuring that a stable, ongoing continuity exists for an institution whose mission is so critical. Thanks to Providence, my co-founder is fully 16 years my junior. I know that his gray hairs, more than my own, do not reveal that, but I want you to know that tonight that I have full confidence that he can continue the DNA. Ours is a rare and fruitful collaboration. Indeed, it has been a brotherhood. I'm mindful at this moment also of the numerous men and women over these 30 years whom Chris and I have worked with, who have given so much of themselves in making this vision a reality. Whether they've served on our board of directors or worked in our offices, or collaborated from afar, each has contributed something unique to extend our message and effectively convince others of its veracity. There's another important debt that I feel tonight that I wish to express to you. It's a debt that I've always felt for those, for those of you who have so generously supported our work. Now let me tell you why. The, the thing about it is, and I've never, there's never been a moment when I haven't been conscious of this one simple fact. And when I haven't impressed it upon uh, our collaborators and our staff. And that is simply this, that everything that we have been able to do for these 31 years has been made possible by the free choice of others to voluntarily part with their money. Money that they could have spent on any number of other things, but have instead entrusted to us. You have believed in the importance of what we are doing, and that is why I feel this very sincere and deep debt. This is a staggering thought to me. Chris and I find ourselves in a very different world today than the one that we confronted from a, that apartment above the flower shop right up here on Crescent three decades ago. At that time, we were living in a, in a world 
that had so recently been sharply divided by the totalitarian dominance of much of Europe. In the area of religion, the long descent from the heights of philosophy and theology had coagulated into an effective attempt to baptize Karl Marx in the name of liberation theology, thus spreading its contagion of communism and Marxism throughout houses of worships and in seminaries. These realities continue to this day to be challenges. But that was the context that gave rise to the founding of the Acton Institute uh, in 1990. Three giants straddled the world stage in those days. These giants would collaborate together to shift the trajectory of things as they had found them. And I want you to know that among the things in my life that I am significantly grateful for, the memory of having met personally each of these titans, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and St. John Paul the Great. Today, however, we find ourselves in a very different world with interlocutors who often appear to come from an entirely different planet. <laughs> the long forced retreat of COVID has afforded some of us the time to think deeply about the divisive state of things that has long been simmering. Now, it would make for a very extended evening, which I know Chris will not permit, were I to attempt to delineate the political, economic, religious, and cultural issues that we're all facing. Besides which, the truth of the matter is you all know them. The quiet isolation and of the pandemic lockdowns may have driven some into a state of madness. For others, it may have been a sustained period of reflection from which we may derive wisdom and prudence that reveal how yet we can save our world. What we are facing today is a set of intertwined, mistaken, but deeply felt explanations for human existence. And these mistakes variously affect people across the board. Let's take a glance for a few moments at some of these confusions. Now, madness is a word that one frequently hears these days to describe the present moment. It is an apt description, I think, of the state of affairs today. Let us remember that madness can result from both nature and nurture. It can exist in some aberration of the physiology of a human person, passed on from one generation to another, but it can also be augmented by the environment that one finds himself within. For that matter, it can exist within both, as when, say, a defect in some genetics is engendered by the context that such a person finds himself in. Some genetic propensity to abuse substances, say. And this person finds himself in a family that facilitates that abuse. This is part of what we see happening before our eyes at this moment. If we were to attempt to analyze the madness at, the, at its root, I suppose one could take a psychological approach as well and say that madness denies the reality of things. For instance, the person sitting in a psychiatric ward who thinks herself, or perhaps himself, the Queen of England. If such a person is unreceptive to our insistence that he or she is not descended from the House of Windsor, and if we were to continue to repeat the claim that they are not descended from the House of Wisdom, uh, Windsor, even this truth, were we to repeat it with greater and greater insistence 
and intensity over and over and over again with the same language, seeing no change in her majesty or his majesty's disposition, we would soon see that the madness can also become contagious, given that one evidence of madness is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. I pause to observe here that it is not just the left that has gone mad, but some of our friends have gone along with them. And I'll elaborate on this in due course. Or we might also take a more theological approach, which I would consider to be a richer and more fuller understanding that the root of the problem goes right back to the proclamation of Satan. Non servium, I will not serve. Or his even more aggressive assertion, ego imperabo, I will rule. This was the original rebellion against the truth, which is why Satan's name is the liar, the deceiver. To bring matters to the present, we live in a world where people have begun to imbibe in this madness the denial of reality in the quest for power. Now, these are not new maladies but the context in which they are accompanying, uh, occurring right now amplifies the maladies. Increasing numbers of people believe that politics can replace civic life, that coercive power can replace the voluntary effort of people to cooperate and look for the truth of things. We have instead seen the substitution of both voluntary cooperation and a belief in the truth. Joined to this, increasing numbers of people deny that there is a truth or that human beings can know the truth. Another dangerous social trend is the loss of a sense of human meaning and even human identity. We are written, witnessing a concerted and rather effective effort to redefine human nature itself, wherein the nature of the human person is seen as something subjective, malleable, and thus manipulable, a socially imposed fiction. The only open question, it seems, is who will do the manipulation, and on what basis, and to what end. And that's where power comes into the equation. Add to this a clear international trend towards secularization. Now, I want to be clear that the idea of a secular realm in human relations is not evil. After all, it was Jesus who said, who drew, drew a distinction between God and Caesar, right? I'm not speaking of a secularization that holds to a distinction between religion as an institution, the church, and the state. That's not what I'm speaking about. What concerns me is the current form of secularism that insists upon the separation of religion and society, that calls any public profession of religious inspiration, of culture, building efforts, calls that a theocracy. I wonder if someday saying God bless you to somebody who sneezes might be a crime. This kind of secularism forms a cruel society because it does not understand an impulse to forgive or the impulse of self-giving generosity, charity. It morphs into an ideology of expediency, of utilitarianism, of materialism, as the explanation of the whole of human life. Indeed, it has contempt for human life. Its rejection of transcendence eviscerates art, beauty, the sense of wonder, because it knows nothing of the mystery of adoration or homage, 
or worship, which is also why it fails to understand the heroic. It mocks heroes instead of producing them. And this is only part of the challenge. It is evident that the seeds of this kind of philosophy have begun to impact the generation known as the millennials. There has been a notable shift in the religious sensibilities of the American landscape. You may already have heard about the group I'm referring to as the Nons. This is a group of people who have no identification with a religious affiliation, even if they grew up in religious households. It has been called the largest growing religion in America. 35% of people 40 years and younger identify as a non. It's worth observing that they largely emerge from a generation that has never seen real fascism or communism or learned from those who lived under those regimes, nor have they experienced real deprivation or even inflation, though they may be about to experience that. <laughs> they grew up in homes largely where the family meal was almost unknown and were increasingly raised by single family households. They grew up instead in the age of the internet and are highly technological. And because of that, the internet, socially isolated. They have data and quick answers at their fingertips. They can Google the answer to most anything. And they're also the most communicative generation on the planet. They have a greater ability to communicate with others and greater numbers of others than any other generation before. And as you might expect, this group resides on the left when it comes to political, economic, and social matters. I must add another layer of complexity to this mix. Consider the effect of that social media on a person's self-perception and on their perception of the world in which we live. Consider what the anonymity, isolation, and superficiality of reading only AI-produced headlines to have an internet-assembled philosophy of life. It is what spills out of the self-referential isolation and anonymity of the technological lifestyle where people no longer have a sense of transcendence or redemption. This gives rise to a deep and disproportionate rage that we have seen displayed online, in the news, and even in our personal interactions. It is the rancor of those who feel let down. It is an irrational bitterness that is nonetheless capable, as I said earlier, of wide dispersion and expression of its pain, and it can also incite others to that. And of course, all of this has been confounded by the experience of COVID. And the experience of the pandemic itself was compounded by the exploitation of our governmental leaders falling over one another to make political gain from the crisis and thus create the economic deficit that stands looming over each of us. If there's one thing everyone agrees upon, it is this fact that the whole thing has been politicized. But this should surprise no one, given the fact that our healthcare system, from credentialing and licensing to research to accreditation to the production of masks and hand sanitizers, have all been under the purview of the regulation of the state. 
the wave of this politicization and its ramifications that I've been outlining from a largely American perspective is not merely occurring in the United States alone, but extends across many parts of the world and has even impacted some within the conservative movement. So I come back to that. What might be called the priority of the political over the personal and the national over the local has captivated, captivated many that we in the past have called friends. And it's exactly the evidence of the danger that I'm speaking about. And so I wonder if the polarization which we're witnessing is not really a refusal to enter into debate but speaks rather to the fact that we've lost, or are quickly losing, a common grammar that is given to us by the natural law. This grammar of which I speak enabled us precisely to disagree with one another, to talk about that disagreement, to understand the disagreement, much of that is gone. I mean, after all, demonizing people is, a, is an easy way out of a debate. The result of this is really a pent-up anger that we see inexplic inexplicitly explode, whether on an airplane or at a voting booth or in the mall or in a public protest. The flashpoint may appear to be a mask, or the lack thereof, or a political opinion, but I suspect that underneath it all, it's really a rage related to our inability to articulate our disagreements, and to trust that those disagreements will be heard by others. And if this continues, all coherence, all coherence is gone. And what remains is only force, not reason or goodness. That is what will end up ruling us. Freedom will be snuffed out. And the risk will be that personality cults will evolve. And they will result in ideology, where people I will identify with their respective brands rather than their thoughts and their thought out processes, their thought out ideas. Now, I hope that after more than three decades of laboring in this field, that I have sufficiently established the credentials that will inoculate me from being canceled for what I'm about to say. But you know what? At 70 years old, you don't worry about being canceled so much anymore. It is. Those, those are the 70 year olds applauding. It is dis disconcerting to see that some of those whom I have long thought of as friends and as part of our band of brothers and the cause of liberty, to engage in an essentially pessimistic tactic that essentially says that if we cannot defeat the left, then what we need to do is lay aside our principles of a limited government and surrender our principles in exchange for obtaining power. Or others seek to retreat from the whole culture, to build a safe enclave of our communities and our communes away from this culture, wait for its destruction, and then we can come out of our caves and rebuild. In effect, what some former allies are saying is that if in the face of our cultural and political crisis, cogently advocating for human liberty 
is not sufficient to establish the good and virtuous society, then we'll cram the truth down other people's throats in the name of a common good by seizing political power. And if we can't do so by reason, persuasion, or truth, we'll do it by force. Aside from this approach really being a rejection of our own principles, it is also infantile. It mimics kids in the schoolyard who say that if it's okay for you to do that, it's okay for me to do that. I don't think that we advance our cause in this way because in the end, it will no longer be our cause. It will not be what we set out to accomplish in the first place. This would be to adopt the tactics of the statists by being more concerned about winning political power than the truth. My friends, the tradition that we hold to, the tradition that we advocate, we hold to and advocate not because it is old and venerable, but because it is true. I am, for one, am not inclined to ignore Lord Acton's dictum about the corrupting nature of power, which would lead some to think that if we can just seize power, the levers of power, then we can bend politics to our good end. I do not believe that simply replacing the members of the Politburo with better people is the right approach. We need, rather, to undermine the very assumption that a Politburo is a good thing to have in the first place. We don't need a Politburo of saints. It won't work. Surrendering principle for power is short-sighted in its attempt to utilize state power to achieve the good. And it flies in the face of the wisdom of a longtime friend, the late Sir Roger Scruton, who once wrote, quote, the reality of politics is action, but action derives, however covertly, from thought and constant action demands constant thought. We have to begin thinking again, my friends, reasoning again, not just politicizing everything again. I'm convinced that the American founders discovered and inherited an ancient set of ideas that initially came from Greece and Rome, but that were refined and elevated by the Jewish and Christian meditations known as the sacred scriptures, the Hebrew and Christian texts. This is not to say that the truths contained in this tradition are the sole inheritance of Western civilization, not at all. Its genius is that it is a common human inheritance. Anyone committed to using his mind and reason can be compelled by the truth that he observes. As to the defects of the American founding, it is as clear to me as day itself that its most deadly flaw, committed in the name of the expediency of the moment to get a nation founded, proved to be its deepest scar, a scar from which we're attempting to heal even to this day. And this scar also relates to the impermeability of human nature. There was at the American founding a monumental contradiction between the idea that all men are created equal 
and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and the embrace of the political enforcement of slavery, and the racism that spread throughout our culture as a result of that. Now we're asked to believe by some that this means that our institutions and our culture are intrinsically, or as the current fashion puts it, systemically racist. Not at all. But my friends, if we take out of the hands of the race hustlers who hurl that accusation at us, any pretense of moral superiority, we will be on our own grounding. Now we can do this only by clearly making the repudiation of racism, as well as the repudiation of any of those who dog whistle its intent, a prominent plank of our agenda. We must do that. We do this by an uncompromised defense of the principles of the American founding and the anthropology that it rests upon, as well as demonstrating the deadly errors being proposed, indeed imposed, especially in government schools and through the cultural media of an entirely different concept of who human beings are. What has made the Acton Institute unique within our family of institutions has not just been its mission, but also the way that we have attempted to carry this mission out in terms of our simultaneous embrace of the truth and the internet, interfaith nature of our experience, of our work. This uniqueness extends well as well to what we call in our office, the tone and timing. That is, the way we enter into a debate and when we enter into the debate. The basis of the Acton Institute's entire approach to the spheres of economics, philosophy, theology, has been to formulate the right ideas and present them respectfully, to the extent that's possible for a Brooklynite, Without apology, from the outset, it was our intention to do this in a way that is interfaith. This room is an example of it. But this can be tricky. We are not synchronistic, mind you, as though the truth doesn't matter, can be negotiated away, or that can be achieved by consensus, no. Religious beliefs, most of the time, are claims to truth. And it should be a given that there will always be a discontinuity, a disagreement among those claims. You know, as a child, I always wondered why people thought it was a great offense to speak about religion and politics at the dinner table. I hope you've had a good meal tonight. Now look at the business that I got myself into. Why should it be offensive if someone wants to convert somebody else to their position? And yet that's, don't judge me. That's like the, the, the worst thing you can do in society. You're telling me I'm wrong. Well, you might be wrong. <laughs> I understand there are a good number of obnoxious religionists in the world. I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. But I simply don't know, I don't understand why some would say, would say that it's not permitted to engage in a conversation where people might disagree, where somebody might want to convert me. We may never be permitted to, pers may we never be permitted to persuade someone that our own position was correct and theirs is mistaken, or the reverse. I remember one time I was engaging in a conversation with a progressive minister on public radio. You already know that I was outnumbered. 
Now, he thought he delivered the coup d'etat to my argument when he pronounced, Father Sirico, you think that everything you believe is true. I pondered this accusation for a moment. It only took a moment. And I replied, and what, sir, do you believe that you do not think is true? Of course we all think that what we believe is the truth, or we wouldn't believe it, I hope, unless you're on that ward with the Queen of England. <laughs> what I think has been a strength of the Acton Institute is that we value people of very divergent religious traditions who come together to work on the Liberty Project. You see, real diversity is bringing people together who are really diverse. Not just people who look diverse, but people who think differently from one another. The human challenge is how to find a path to an authentic pluralism that honors this diversity at the same time that it enables people to live in harmony without forcing anyone to give up their truth claims or denying the living of their faith. And I would hope to do this in a winsome and an open manner. We're always free to propose things to others, but never to impose things upon others. For me, I'm a Catholic Christian. Now, I know this may seem oxymoronic to some of our friends, but as I say, we're free to disagree. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity who founded a church. My highest personal purpose is to spread this truth and to invite others to come to believe that. Some years ago, I was at a meeting made up largely of evangelicals, and I was asked by a gentleman who saw that I was a priest, he asked me, do you know Jesus? I did not take offense. I merely said, why, yes, I do. And I know his mother as well. <laughs> Would you like an introduction? <laughs> More broadly, I don't see why our civic conversations have to begin and end with a doctrinal pronouncement. I think that doctrinal pronounce pronouncements are very important, but I don't think that our civic dialogue has to begin and end with them. They need to begin, our dialogues need to begin with engagement, with openness, with respect, with charity. And this is what I mean, what I mean by tolerance. Not an endorsement of what I consider to be wrong or immoral. It is rather an, agree an agreement not to go to war with others who may be in error who are even immoral. It is not enough to state the truth. One must state it in a convincing manner and in a way that people understand and find it to be compelling. Let us remember that Jesus had his own set of interlocutors and that he was most harsh with those who sought to lay heavy burdens on the shoulders of others. For the rest, he was merciful, patient, and kind. Today, as I say, the grammar of the debate has changed. People used to be able to clash, actually clash, in their opinions. They used to be able to disagree with one another based on this common grammar structure. 
of communicating ideas. You can see numerous examples of this on the firing line program that was hosted by the founder of the National Review, William F. Buckley Jr., who incidentally stood right about here 31 years ago at the first of our annual dinners in this very room. Today, some people use an entirely new language, a whole new set of propositions, and this opens for us a whole new set of challenges. My point is that if all we do is to keep going over and over and doing what we have done before, saying things in the same way that we have said them, we cannot expect to get a different result unless, as I said earlier, we are mad. We must engage and more creatively execute our mission along these lines in the face of this new challenge. I take some instruction from an ancient principle outlined by Thomas Aquinas in his Summa. Betsy, here comes some more Latin. <laughs> Aquinas said, quid quid recipitor ad modum recipientes recipitor. That is, that the disposition of the receiver of a message determines how they hear the message that they receive. An analogy helps. Think of an antenna. The reliability of the antenna affects the quality of the accuracy of the transmission that the antenna receives. So we need to look at what needs to be repaired in the antenna to ensure an effective transmission of the message. At the end of the day, somebody may reject the message even if they receive it clearly, but the point is that the antenna today is faulty because of the rejection of the very tool of cognition, the way in which we know, which is reason. So even as we have to retain a foundation of our fundamental mission, we also have to peri periodically update this articulation. You know, we used to publish our ideas only in English when we first began. Today, our ideas are published in any language on the planet thanks to technology. Our primary audience, audiences were mostly personal in one way or another, through lectures or conferences and the like. Now, we broadcast to incalculable numbers of people virtually through the web. This year especially, Technology has enabled us to amplify our voice and extend our audiences. And as I depart tonight from my role as president of the Acton Institute, though I assure you, not from my involvement with or commitment to its mission, I detect that there's a new a need for us to amplify our voice once again in order to be heard and understood by audiences that we may have not effectively engaged previously. And I'm not speaking here only about technology, but about broadening our audiences through a new mode of conversation. In the face of all the confusion and the consternation that I have described this evening, the Acton Institute's core mission remains steadfast and will continue to be what it has always been. In fact, its mission, as has already been noted several times this evening, is all the more critical with the polarization and the confusion that we see about us. I believe with all my heart that this is the moment for which the Acton Institute was born this mission has been expressed in various circumlocutions over the years, but it all, all boils down to the effort to see and to understand the connection between a moral vision 
of life and the practical living out of that telos and the workaday world in which most people, virtually all people, find, them, find themselves. Finance, work, and business. That is to say, the economic dimension of human existence. It is to bring freedom and virtue together, to build a society that is both free and good. There remains much work to be done. Until the parousia, we live in a fallen world with defects which will never we will never be able to repair if we do not begin first with an honest examination of our consciences and a fearless moral and inventory prompting us to repair the wrongs. We can all be thankful that reality is a stubborn thing, being reality, and the one fact that human beings will never be able to escape is that they are in fact human beings with a particular nature that is constant despite the rantings of someone at the end of a corridor in a psych ward or in a poli-sci department at Harvard. <laughs> someone recently described to me that America is a garden hacked out of a jungle. I like that image. Jungles always want to overtake gardens. The entire metaphor itself, of course, comes from the creation, from the book of Genesis, where God situates the human family precisely in the context of scarcity and vulnerability, in a garden. And then he gives them the command to cultivate it. You and I have been set in a garden in this world, here and now. And we are here and now at the most prosperous period in human history where people in all parts of the world live better than any of their ancestors. Still, too many people do not understand what it is to cultivate a garden. Some of them are like New Yorkers. <laughs> not for nothing. They have little personal experience of a garden. Others just assume that gardens have always just been there. It falls to us to communicate the knowledge of how to till gardens and to hand that on to the next generation. And this prompts a memory in my mind of something the great Ronald Reagan once observed. He said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought, fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same." Close quote. I know that nostalgia can prompt us to see the past in an overly positive light, kind of editing out all of the problems, all of the unpleasantries, which is why there is some truth to that old phrase that we can never go home again. I know that I can tend to forget that while those delightful summer nights growing up in Brooklyn were unforgettable, it remains that there was no air conditioning back then. <laughs> As we survey the cultural wreckage that is our present moment, wherein people have largely forgotten how to speak with one another, we can only move forward to a better world if we stick to that rock of human dignity, which is the result of having an eternity inscribed on our hearts. This truth is accessible to all people everywhere. 
From the outset, our mission has been projected through the lens of anthropology. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? This has been the starting question given to us by the psalmist. We take this approach because we know that if we do not answer that question, who is man, correctly, no answer that we will ever come up with will satisfy the human quest for meaning or result in real human flourishing. When this reality is denied, the quest for power becomes insatiable and only results in human misery. Now I know that this is the moment when I'm expected to pass the gavel to my friend, my colleague, my brother, Chris Maurin. Yet the truth is, thankfully, that he's always had his hand on that gavel. <laughs> so perhaps then it is merely the altering of the position of the hands. My friends, these past three decades have been among the most joyful, the most challenging, and the very best years of my life. Were I to die tomorrow, let it be said that I was blessed with at least three lifetimes, much more than I deserve. So I am thankful tonight to Almighty God, who in his great mercy redeemed me. And to many of you in this room this evening and beyond it, God bless you all and thank you.